and that was a consistent message that they got. So they did some samplings of what was the natural frequency of the floor. And the natural frequency of the floor was about the same as the average human stomach. And so as people walked on it, there was, it was oscillating basically similar to what the stomach is. And so the stomach would slosh a little bit more than usual and people would sell sick by it. And so they fixed it by dampening it, by changing the, the natural frequency of the floor. So Dukeman errors is usually done as an example of that. The trouble is that's not actually what's happening there. Because if Tacoma and Eris was an example of resonance where the driving force matched the frequency, that means you get a puff of wind to get it vibrating, then there'd be a second puff of wind at just the right time in order to get it to vibrate more, and then another puff of wind, and the wind is coming through at a pretty consistent basis. So it's more of a fluttering effect, and you can try this at home. You take a, just take a piece of paper and just blow right on the edge here, that far end is gonna start fluttering. That's more of what's happening here. And so, and then if you have anything oscillating back and forth, you eventually hit a fatigue strength, and you know, the point at which it's gonna just start collapsing. You take a paper clip, you can bend it back and forth, and at some point it will break, even though you're not exceeding its tensile strength, at, at least not initially. Uh, questions about anything up to here? All right, so let's see what I've missed so far. Stuff I haven't covered, which I think you can pick up easily enough from the text. So let's talk about some things, such as you got the quiz on 21 and the master set on 21 due Tuesday. Tomorrow we got a lab. Taxes are due at the end of next week. Friday of next week. All right, here's a proposal. So Tuesday is the quiz on 21, Ambassador Center 21. Thursday of next week, the quiz on 22, Master Set on 22. And then on the 17th, that would be the 19th. Test one. Any counter proposals? Um, we don't think. The quiz on 22 is that the, or uh, is the 14th? Yeah, the Thursday, a week from tomorrow. So that will be the day that the lab is due to? Yes. Uh, is there going to be an, a lab on that on that day? Before? Probably not. Or it'll be a short one. Are you talking about this the the, the chapter twenty two test? You're not talking about twenty one test. Quiz. No, the chapter twenty one quiz. Yeah, yeah, the is Tuesday. Yeah. I'm proposing a week from tomorrow the chapter twenty two quiz. Yeah. And master set, and then the first test that's on everything we've done so far up till here is on the nineteenth. Okay, the that's not this, that's not next week. That's the following week. Correct. All right, yeah. Right, okay, that's fine. All right. Are we gonna have another 
like test tests between then and the end of the semester? Yeah. Yes, there will be. All the light, the light stuff. So the one so the semester ends on the twenty ninth? Yeah. What's our last day? I think our last day in here is the twenty eighth. Twenty ninth is a Friday. Okay. Yeah. Plenty of time or whatever. About five days. Ooh. Well, we're going to start new material now, so. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's check the, the first test. No, I mean, like, because I know we, we just finished in the sound chapter. Right. All right, so which chapter are we about to go to? Uh, the, we, the next bit starts chapter 33. There's a bunch of chapters right before that. I'm going to summarize up in four equations and just talk about that conceptually about what we get, how we get to chapter 33. Other questions right now? I feel like this class, this class should be a full semester. <laughs> uh, I understand that it will be in the fall. There was some concession, and the powers that be decided to make it a full semester course. Yeah. It's pretty much material for three quarters of the semester. Because um, this class is called Physics, Sound, and Light, and we only have one day on sound and two weeks on light. Yeah, I mean, but you know, so some of the stuff on sound. We didn't have to go over because we I know, I know. I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's funny that we only talked about sound for yesterday and today. Yeah, yeah. And light will be probably after the 19th, so. 10 days. Or, yeah, so 10 days. Nine days, nine days. Nine days. Yeah, well, we're starting light right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But, but. Yeah, the, 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 the title is not. Does not seem to match the yeah, yeah. the yeah. amount of content in the course. Mm -hmm. It's just like okay, not just like Empire Strikes Back, where the first ten minutes of the movie was what half the budget. Some of the notation here. This phi sub e, <clears throat> this is known as magnetic, or sorry, wrong word, wrong word, electric flux. It's just an indication of if I have an electric field, that's what the E is. If I have an electric field that is zipping through the room, so let's say I have this. Just, it's a vector, so just imagine I've got these arrows shooting across the room. <clears throat> the electric flux is a way of indicating how much of that is actually going to pierce a surface. So if I hold my notebook up like this, I'm going to get a whole bunch of arrows piercing the surface. As I turn it over like this, I have a lot fewer piercing the surface. So. This is the area right here, and the dot in between, it is supposed to be a dot there. It's called a dot product. And that is indicating the angle, the, the basically the orientation of the surface relative to the, the electric field. Now the electric field originally stemmed from this idea of, I have a universe here, if I have a positive charge here and I have a positive charge here, what's going to happen? Okay, probably not that violent, but push the other way. All right. So I have a universe here with just my positive charge. 
sit there, has no idea of anything else in the universe, because there is nothing else in the universe. And then I said, put a second charge here. So this is here initially, and then I put the second one in. And you tell me that they're going to go away from each other. Yeah. How does he know that he exists? Not a magnetic field between them. Not a magnetic field. That's where the electric field comes in. That the idea of the electric field is that before this charge exists, this thing is giving off an electric field. And I'm the only one who will call it this. It's kind of like electric pheromones. And then the first, the second charge has no idea it exists. It just knows that there's an electric field here, and it goes, ooh. Uh, I'm going to go in the same direction as the electric field. If I put a negative charge here, it will be attracted, or it senses the electric field and goes, ooh, I wonder what the source of that is. So that's what the electric field is. <clears throat> if I take any three-dimensional surface here, it could be a virtual surface. It's generally known as a Gaussian surface. That if I have a charge inside, it's going to basically produce its electric field that's going to go through the surface. There is a rule called Gauss's law of electricity that says that if I have that the electric flux through any closed surface, so CS for closed surface, is equal to whatever the charge is inside divided by this constant here, which is known as the permittiv known as permittivity. This little zero there next to the epsilon is indicate permittivity of free space. So if I have basically emptiness and I have a charge there, then the, whatever charge is inside here, divided by this value right here, gives me what's is the electric flux through the closed surface. What's in the numerator? Q and then what's that? That is right here? Yeah. E and C for enclosed. Closed. Closed. And Q is charge. Because of course. Actually, I think it comes from the word quantity, whoever started it. There's a quantity of charge. Except there's probably nothing in that. All right, so we have this rule right here. Now, electric fields can have a beginning and an end. Magnetic fields, on the other hand, until someone actually finds a magnetic monopole, Magnetic fields don't have a beginning and end. They basically, every magnetic field basically will eventually loop around and back onto itself. So there's a Gauss's law of magnetism that says the magnetic flux through any closed surface is equal to zero. Because if I have a magnet in here for the north and south pole, that any lines I have piercing the surface here is going to pierce the surface at another point going the other direction, and it'll all cancel out. What does the D stand for? D for magnetic field. All right. And I believe that comes about is whoever started it needed to come up with letters, and the first thing he did, the first variable he needed, he used the letter A, the second one used the B, then he used the C for the next one, and so on. Phi sub B is the magnetic flux. Which is just the magnetic field times the area. Now, if I've got a current flowing through a wire, it's going to create a magnetic field. Actually, all I need is a moving charge. I take any charge and it moves, I create a magnetic field. 
And it turns out that if I take some path around, it doesn't have to be a circle, it could be any path that I want. Take any path of, of, that it circles a line of current or moving charge. Then if I take the magnetic field times the length as I go around, that is gonna be equal to, and actually we'll put a little summation sign in there because if I add them all up, that is gonna be equal to a different constant. This is known as the permeability. And it really would have been nice that if they chose a word that didn't sound anything like permittivity, but permeability times the current that's in, encircled by our line here, plus the permeability times the permittivity times the change in the electric flux with time. This is known as, this part right here is known as Ampere's Law. Um, the accent mark goes that way. Ampere, um, my typical bad French pronunciation. With the Maxwell contribution or correction. So Ampere came up with his law. There was an exception uh, where it did not seem to hold. And so Maxwell figured that part out. Turned out to be a critical piece. So this is Ampere's law with the Maxwell correction. This is, this is Gauss's law of electricity. And Gauss's law of magnetism. And then the fourth law is usually known as Faraday's law. Uh, however, I think Lentz deserves credit, so I call it the Faraday and Lentz's law. Some people call it Faraday's law, and then Lentz has a contribution to it. They actually work it independently of each other, and Faraday got the concept first, Lentz got the math first, so at least based on my reading of the history. And what Faraday figured out is that he had a current here with a battery in it and a switch. He had a separate bit of wire here with an ammeter or probably galvanometer, some way of measuring current. And the second wire was not touching the first wire. They were independent of each other. When he flipped the switch, so we suddenly have a current flowing through this, the, larger, the larger circuit that I've drawn here, that the wire, that the, the meter here would twitch and then back to zero. When he took, when he opened up the switch, the needle twitched the other direction and went back to zero. He played around some more and he realized that what matters here is that when the switch is made, a current flows through here, that current creates a magnetic field, which creates a magnetic flux inside here. And it's the changing magnetic flux which causes the needle to twitch. So if we add up the electric field along this loop here, uh, it is a closed loop, just like this needs to be a closed loop. Add up the electric field times my length. That's gonna be equal to the negative change in my magnetic flux with time. Doesn't seem like much. These four equations here, this one, this one, and then the two Gauss laws, these are known now as Maxwell's equations. Even though Maxwell contributed this part, but what Maxwell did with them got him the fame. If you'll indulge me just another couple minutes, uh, I'd be glad to take it if you're good with that. Mm -hmm. This is Maxwell. This is what this is the math part that Maxwell contributed. But the, Does that say correction up there? Yes, yes. 
But the four equations are known to Maxwell's equations. He did not call it that. He, he actually had some humility. So if these are true, then think about this. I take a charge Q and I move it over to here. If I'm sitting here observing it, well, the charge gives off an electric field. As the charge moves, my ele the electric field changes. So if I have a change in the electric field, I have a change in the electric flux. If my electric flux changes, I'm going to create a magnetic field. If the charge then moves back, so basically I have my electric field goes from one plane to the other, my electric field changes. If my electric field changes, I change my electric flux, which causes a magnetic field. The magnetic field's going to change because my electric flux changes at a different rate. And if my magnetic field changes, the magnetic flux will change, which will cause an electric field. So what's happening here is if this charge is moving back and forth, I have this self-propagating situation here where I have a change in electric field causes a magnetic field, which changes, which causes an electric field, which causes a magnetic field, which causes an electric field, which causes a magnetic field. Maxwell then said, all right, so I have this thing that's self-propagating. Can we figure out how fast it's going? And you can't, I'm not gonna go through the derivation for this class, but he figured out that the speed that this wave would travel would be one over the square root of mu sub naught over epsilon sub naught, which is approximately three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Maxwell, at the end of the paper, and this is the 1870s, I think, at the end of the paper says, this seems too much like the speed of light. It seems too much of a coincidence. I spec he speculates that light is an electromagnetic wave. And then it turns out he's right. Uh, but this also is the stepping wall point into special relativity because physicists looked at that and said, wow, great. It looks like light is an electromagnetic wave. It is too much of a coincidence, but there's a mistake. So I'll leave that right there with some physicists claiming there's a mistake here. And it's not for another 30 years before someone says there's not a mistake there. Here's why. The question, but the question I asked with you, the dropping off here is, what seems to be missing from that equation about the speed